It's West Rockies. We're sitting here with Stanton Friedman, the amazing nuclear physicist, um, professional ufologist who has brought so much to the table. You've obviously been here before. How are you finding it this year? You know, uh, any highlights for you? It, 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 there are an awful lot of people here. A lot of people want to talk. What I can say is this, that I continue to find that there's enormous public interest in the subject of flying saucers, that there is uh, not a very high level of knowledge about flying saucers and the technical data and the big studies and things like that. But acceptance, yes. And sightings are really very common. So uh, I'm finding people are asking interested questions. They're here to learn more. I enjoy conferences. I am so pleased at how the direction things have been changing the last few years, especially mo most people think most people don't believe in UFOs, even though most people do. So what I'm saying is people are quite ready, willing, and able to understand that we're probably not alone. This has changed a lot because of the Kepler satellite. A good number these days, according to astronomers I know, is that every star has between 1 and 1.6 planets per star. They could have 8, they could have none. Now, what that means is, in our galaxy, the Milky Way, there are probably 200 billion stars, so 200 billion planets. And to bring it home a little closer, it means that within 100 light years, there are approximately 10,000 stars, or therefore 10,000 planets. And some of them are a lot closer to each other than we are to the next guy over. So we're out in the boondocks, 4.3 light years to the next star. In the famous Betty and Barney Hill case, abduction that happened in New Hampshire, there was a star map. I was the first to publish about the star map. Anyway, the basic stars in this map, Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticuli. It's a constellation of reticuli. It means the net. Uh, now, those two stars are only 39.3 light years from here. But from each other, they're only an eighth of a light year. That means they're 35 times closer to each other than we are to the next star over. We're out in the boondocks. These guys got next door neighbors. From a planet around one looking at the other, it's visible all day long. And I would expect that the incentive for interstellar travel is greater the closer the neighbor. It just makes sense to me. So now, 100 years ago, a lot of people would have said this is the only solar system, so we're probably the only planet. And Three cheers for us. Uh, now, it looks like there are planets all over the place. And so, I get very few people saying, surely we're the only ones. Pat Robertson has said all the intelligent life in the universe is on Earth. And that the Earth was created 6,000 years ago. Uh, most people think they left six zeros out of that number. So there's been an acceptance of man isn't as special as he used to like to think he was. I mean, Copernicus's book suggesting that, would you believe the earth was not the center of the universe, was banned for 300 years because everybody knew it was. Everything goes around the earth, right? No, wrong. Everything goes around the sun. That wasn't right either. So our perception of where we fit in the scheme of things has changed drastically. And I'm very pleased about that. Now, one thing I can add to the discussion. I worked on far-out propulsion systems. for companies like GE, GM, Westinghouse, etc. And we now know that almost all the energy in the universe is produced by nuclear fusion. H-bombs, if you want to look at it that way. Now, what difference does that make? Well... Uh, I did a study of the application of nuclear fusion to deep space propulsion in 1962, long time ago. I was a wee broth of a lad, of course. Uh, and th the bottom line was, if you want to go, we know how to do it. All you need is dough. It costs money. These, these development programs are very expensive. As an example, my first job out of college a long time ago was working on nuclear airplanes, General Electric Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Department. In 1958, we spent $100 million. We employed 3,500 people, of whom 1,100 were engineers and scientists. This wasn't six professors and 12 grad students, in other words. And we never flew a nuclear-powered airplane. So 
Programs to develop these things cost a lot of money. There's no question about that. But the notion that you can't get here from there, which is what the astronomers will try to sell you, is simply untrue. No, you can't do it on a bicycle. But there are other means, fission and fusion rockets. And um, what do you say to people? I mean, I, I don't know what um, Stephen Hawking's current view is, but he he said that yes it is likely that there's probably life out there intelligent life but it's not likely that it's contacted us what what do you say to that he hasn't looked at the evidence that that's the problem with the seti communities seti's search for extraterrestrial intelligence really stands for silly effort to investigate it's not based on any study of the evidence you look at the books i refer to their books they don't refer to mine <laughs> Uh, he also has said, we shouldn't let anybody know we're here because uh, look what Columbus's visit did, you know, to North America kind of thing. Well, the important thing is we have evidence that aliens are coming here. In my lectures, I talk about five large-scale scientific studies. And I check after each one after showing some of the data that's in them. How many people here have read this? I'm lucky if it's 2% who've read any of them. So there are four basic rules for UFO debunkers. One, don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. Two, what the public doesn't know, I'm not going to tell them. Three, if you can't attack the data, attack the people. It's easier. Nobody will know the difference. And four, do your research by proclamation. Investigation is too much trouble. So I, I've done debates, one debates even at Oxford University Debating Society. I was very impressed. Some of the people there had tuxedos on. Nobody told me that. We won the debate, though, so that's what mattered. So the I, I've done debates on Coast to Coast Radio, for example. Dr. Seth Shostak of the SETI Institute. Uh, I got 57% of the vote. He got 33%. And 10% said, I don't know. I did a debate with Dr. Michael Shermer of the Skeptic Society. Uh, I got 80% of the vote. He got 20%. Uh, he didn't know anything about the subject, which was, uh, if I'm going to debate somebody, I wish they at least had looked at the basic data, for goodness sakes. So there's a lot of aspects. One thing that I do know is that I have more experience with the national security than most of the debunkers. I worked on classified programs for 14 years. I, it's easy to prove I didn't bring them with me, but the National Security Agency eventually released 156 pages of top-secret Umbra UFO data. Wow! The only trouble is you could read one line per page. Everything else was whited out. Uh, CIA released dozens of pages of top-secret Umbra CIA UFO documents. Almost everything was blacked out. Anybody who says there isn't a cover-up hasn't looked at the evidence. And uh, there's something that a lot of people don't seem to know. Everybody will talk about Project Blue Book. That was the Air Force group concerned with UFOs. They don't tell you about what General Carol Bolander said. He was an Air Force general, an engineer, worked on the uh, lunar excursion module. Good engineer, as a matter of fact. He was asked, because the University of Colorado suggested that Project Blue Book be closed back in 1969, he was asked, what should we do about it? Get an official Air Force viewpoint, you know. So he wrote a memo, which I didn't see until 10 years later. But in the memo, he said, reports of UFOs, which could affect national security, are made in accordance with JNAP, Joint Army-Navy Air Force Publication 146, or Air Force Manual 55-11, and are not part of the Blue Book system. That's an extraordinary statement. The Air Force is saying the only group there is is Blue Book. Two paragraphs later, he says, uh, if we close Project Blue Book, and it was closed as a result of this memo, uh, the public won't have any place to report sightings. However, as previously noted, reports which could affect national security will continue to be investigated using the procedures designed for that purpose. Well, I needed to talk to him, so I located him. Much easier to find Carol Bolander than Tom Smith. And I explained that I'd had a clearance for 14 years, very interested in this memo. As it seems to me like you're saying that there were two separate communication channels for UFO sightings. One, and somebody had just told me one two weeks before I talked to him, uh, if a saucer goes down the runway at a strategic air command base where nuclear weapons are stored, I think by definition that's a matter for national security. 
He agreed. I said, but if my wife and I are driving down the street and we see a UFO, big deal happens all the time, you know. And he agreed. Two separate communication channels. And so where did the sightings go that could affect national security? That's where the mysterious Majestic 12 comes in. I'd show you my book, but I sold the last one. <laughs> Top Secret Magic. This is a group set up by President Truman in 1947 because of Roswell. A group set up to deal with the UFO question. And it seems a logical way to do things. There have been several crash saucer stories. I'm the original civilian investigator, the Roswell incident, for example. Now, obviously, you want to analyze the materials. You want to say what they're made out of, what their characteristics are, and all that sort of stuff. Well, there really ought to be only one group that does this, high security and people with high competence. Uh, there are many reports of military aircraft chasing UFOs with all kinds of equipment making measurements. Again, there should only be one group. Well, obviously, I don't have my own radar installation. I don't have my own satellite or anything like that. And I think the good stuff, who cares about the bad stuff, is going to Operation Majestic 12. And so uh, I'm excited about that. And I, in my book, I deal with all the objections made by the noisy negativists. None of them stand up. So it's a complicated world. Some people think, oh, if those guys who were listed as a part of uh, Majestic 12, they certainly would have told their wives what they were doing. I worked under security for 14 years. I never told my wife anything class about it. it would violate the rules, and it would put her at risk. And, you know, the old line, loose lips sink ships. Uh, you can't tell your friends without telling your enemies. Somebody's paying attention. So, also, I worked on fusion propulsion systems for deep space travel. A lot of people think, you can't get here from there. It's too far. That's about as silly as saying that, how long does it take to go around Earth? Well, Magellan took three years, his ship did. So let's say things have improved, a year and a half maybe. The space station does it in 95 minutes. <laughs> Technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. The future is not an extrapolation of the past. A laser isn't just a better light bulb, entirely different physics. <laughs> so there are no good objections to UFO reality, only people who haven't studied the relevant evidence. Quick question. I'm intrigued to know, um, with the recent uh, news uh, about Stephen Hawking putting millions, I think, maybe billions, into no. research. A Soviet billionaire is putting up the money. And they're talking about sending little vehicles out there. It seems so silly to me that you worry about who's listening out there and who's sending signals. When there's so much evidence that aliens are visiting, for goodness sakes, never referred to by those guys. It's a strange world. You know, uh, I think a great deal of Stephen Hawking as a theoretical physicist, but he doesn't have anything to do with knowledge about UFOs or interstellar travel. Look, there was a, a professor of astronomy in 1941, heard science fiction writers talking about uh, going to the moon. He said, well, that's absurd. He published a paper in a scientific journal showing the required initial launch weight of a rocket to get a man to the moon and back would be a million, million tons. So forget about it. Well, as it happens, the Saturn V on liftoff weighed 3,000 tons. He made every possible stupid assumption about how you go about doing it. It's easy to prove things are impossible if you make the wrong assumptions. Um, you covered the Betty and Barney Hill case. Obviously, you're, yes. you're the go-to guy, um, Travis Walton as well. It, yes. Is there any other case that's captured you in the same way that they have? The Roswell case. I was the first civilian investigator of the Roswell incident. Heard about it just by accident at a television station. Doing three interviews before speaking at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I did the first two, and the third interviewer was nowhere to be found. It's before cell phones. And the station manager's giving me coffee. He's looking at his watch. He knows I have other things to do. A lot of promo. And now the blue, he says, the guy you ought to talk to is Jesse Marcel. And brilliant investigator that I am. I said, who's he? Changed my life with his answer. He handled pieces of the wreckage of one of those saucers you're interested in when he was in the military. What? Where'd that come from? What do you know about him? He lives in Homa. That didn't tell me anything because I didn't know where Homa, Louisiana was. 
Next morning from the airport, I was there early, called information in Homa, still didn't know where it was, but, and talked to Jesse. And he told me the story. And people say, well, wasn't it all classified? He's one of the few people who couldn't deny his involvement because the article, his name was all over the world. And he told me the story. I was very favorably impressed. I shared it with a colleague. In the next year and a half, we found 62 people connected with the Roswell incident. And uh, first book came out, the Roswell incident in 1980. I did my own book, Crash at Corona. And so I'm still speaking every year at the uh, Roswell Festival on UFOs. First week in July. Uh, last year they had almost 10,000 people there for the three days. The rest of the year they had 184,000 people visiting the International UFO Museum and Research Center. And Roswell isn't on the way to anywhere. It's in the middle of nowhere. I mean, literally. Uh, well, it's 200 miles from Albuquerque, 200 miles from Amarillo, 200 miles from El Paso. So, enormous interest in the subject. And because I worked on far-out propulsion systems, I'm known for that, too. I've done debates, which I have won. I'm a full-time ufologist, and there aren't many of us around. Thank you so much for this interview. It's incredible, and it's incredible to meet you. So thank you very much. 